Well, I see a few people have gone home and things have thinned out a little bit. But it's my extreme pleasure to introduce my son, Gary Open. Uh, Gary is probably what I would consider the ideal son. Uh, and I will just tell you that I am the luckiest man you ever met in your life because this fine young man has taught me so much and we work together every day and rarely have any complaints except if you watched when I lectured yesterday and you were here, he thought I was going to run over and he was going like this. Dad, Dad, you're late again. One of those deals. In any case, Gary um, graduated from Colgate University where my older son went and so did I, so we were in the mouth, toothpaste and whatever. His grandfather, my father, was an inner nose and throat specialist, and uh, so our family's been in the mouth for three generations. Um, Gary graduated Colgate, went then to dental school at Tufts University, graduated top of his class there, and um, he'll hit me for saying that. And uh, then he went to UConn for his ortho, program where Charlie Burstone and Ravi Nanda and Flavio and all these people that many of you know were there. Um, he graduated, uh, what year was that? Uh, 1998. 1998, we've been practicing together ever since. Um, he is uh, an expert in dealing with craniofacial stuff as well as the animal assisted uh, therapy uh, I'm along as the tail end of it, but he is, uh, he's going to tell you a little bit about our magical dog because he's pretty amazing. Uh, we just did a genetic study on him, and uh, he'll tell you about that too, I'm sure. But in any case, I'm so pleased, so delighted, and right. so excited to introduce to you my son, Gary Open. Uh, thank you, Pop Pop. <laughs> Don't fall. <laughs> All right. Can everybody hear me OK? Yeah, I assume. All right. Um, today's talk, we're going to talk a little bit about having an animal, um, specifically a dog in your office, for so many reasons. Before I wanted to start my talk, first I wanted to thank everyone, uh, Dr. Miller, for running an unbelievable meeting, the, the staff who's taking care of it, um, Jill, Darren, and um, Scott, and uh, it's, this is kind of f full circle for me. I've been coming to these meetings since I was about seven years old, and I see the interaction now. There's some kids who are here interacting with other kids from different parts of the country, and when I was here, I became friends, many of you know, uh, the Sugiyamas, their child, and they used to spend a week at my house, and I'd go to California a week and spend in their house. Um, I've been probably to about most more meetings than almost anyone here. Most of them I didn't know what, anything about orthodontics, but I've been here, I've been coming for about, I counted last night, about 21 years, I think. So let's get started here. As Dad said, we went to the University of Connecticut, and I work at the craniofacial unit with my father, who's one of the founding members. Um, my dad said a lot about me. Um, I'll just touch real quick it, kind of like the Alexanders, very fortunate. My dad's my best friend. I get to see him every day, and uh, he's taught me so much. Now what I'm gonna do is before we get into the meat of it, I'm just gonna give a little history about animal therapy or animal-assisted therapy in all the whole medical fields. The first um, signs of someone having animal-assisted therapy was in York Retreat in England in the 18th century, so it goes back pretty far. And what they found is it was the first facility that believed mentally ill patients could recover and be treated with respect, sympathy, and dignity. These patients wandered the grounds that had many small animals. And these animals, they say, encouraged social, socialization, benevolent, benevolent feelings, and means of communication. In 1860, there was another hospital called Bethlehem Hospital that followed suit. They saw the positive aspects of this. Then you get to, sick. most people know Sigmund Freud. Uh, he had a dog named Joe Fi. When he found he was in the room with some of his patients, the patients, the dog would signal um, how much tension the patients had. If the patient was very tense, 
the dog would go to the opposite side of the room. If the patient was a little bit more calm, the dog would go towards the patient. So it's already showing that these animals can understand without talking to them a patient's um, nervousness, stress, um, their feeling of being depressed or not. Um, then you go into Florence Nightingale. She's the first nurse in the United States in the 1800s found that animals were really good for infirmed patients. She saw positive effects on their recovery. She saw them to recover a little bit more quicker. quicker. And in 1919, the military started to um, recognize some of these benefits and started to use them for some of their psychiatric patients. Dr. Borns Levinson, in 1961, he accidentally discovered the use of his, jo his dog, Jingles. Um, he had some difficult patients, and when he found when he put the dog in the room, these patients calmed, they communicated a lot better during their visits. And the strategy was to bridge this communication, and at the time it was presented to the American Psychological Association to mix reviews. Some people really weren't accepting these views yet, and it took a while for people to, um, to get them across. Marcus um, looked at therapy dogs on patients of his that had fibromyalgia. I, spelled, I said that totally wrong, but that's okay. Um, what he found is that he had a control group and a treatment group. And he found that patients who were coming in for their treatment were put in the room with a dog. And the other group found that they were not, didn't get this experience with their dog became, before they came into their treatment. And what they had is the animals that, patients with the animals in the room found a, a much higher pain reduction before they came into their appointment. And they thought these improvements were, pre were preparing the patient for a more successful and better visit. We're gonna talk about him in a little bit, but that's Cooper uh, lying in a patient's lap. This patient actually has a cranial facial cleft, has a cleft palate. And you'll see, this is just what he does. Um, he's one amazing animal. Now I'm just gonna go into a couple definitions just to kind of get everything on the baseline. There's animal-assisted activities. And what this is, they're for um, motivational, educational, recreational, therapeutic um, visits. And they're there to enhance the quality of life of someone. So it's kind of like a casual meet and greet. You bring the pet into a room. You have no goal set. It's just to um, get them to meet the dog and, try to ch and kind of change their, their sense or their, um, their attitude. Then there's animal assisted therapy. And this is goal or oriented intervention, intervention and it's directed or delivered by a healthcare professional within their scope of their field. Its job is to promote improvement in, psych, in uh, social, emotional, and cognitive function. And with these, you have specific goals for the treatment. So this would be if a dog comes into a room to um, you know, calm patients or a hospital to see these patients, it has a specific goal and a specific, specific job in what they're looking for that animal to do. Um, in 1977, three doctors, a veterinarian, a psychiatrist and a physician got together and said, you know what? There's no cohesiveness in this group. We're seeing the benefits of these animals. So what they did is they um, founded something called the Delta Society. And before then, it was a lot of anecdotal stories. You know, the dog comes in, patients feel better. Depressed patients see the dog, it feels better. They wanted to document this, um, kind of like what we're doing now in the AAO. So they needed some scientific research. Then, not that long ago, Delta Society switched their name to Pet Partners. They thought that it really wasn't representative of them. No one knew what Delta Society was. But when they changed their name to Pet Partners, they thought that there'd be more recognition. Um, it's the largest and most prestigious organization that trains and reg registers animals teams. There's about 11,000 in the United States. There are other organizations on there that can certify you as being a therapy dog. This is not the only one. Um, their goal is to improve um, human, physical, social, emotional, and cognitive functions. 
Their vision is a world which people who have mental and physical disabilities and patients in healthcare facilities with professionally trained animals to help improve their health. And these dogs are, they're certified, they're official, you know, through, they're recognized throughout the United States. There's a lot of places you can go. You go to Amazon, you can buy a dog vest saying therapy dog and put it on the dog. Um, no one knows if it is or if it isn't, but if you're gonna do it and you want someone in your office, or animal in your office, some questions are gonna come up and you really need to get it done the right way. All right, so what Pet Partners is, it requires the dog and the handler to pass a basic obedience class, a good, canine good citizen test, and a therapy dog test. And they are recognized by the American Kennel Association. Now, types of therapy animals. Most people associate dogs. Dogs are the therapy animals. However, they do um, certify other animals, as you see. Cats, guinea pigs, rabbits, rats, horses, donkeys, llamas, alpacas, potbelly pigs, and birds. Um, one of the big ones right now is horses, um, with children who, have, children who are autistic. They find when they put these children on a horse, they can communicate, they can bond with this horse. It helps them um, in some of their you know, communication skills, their balance skills. It gives them a goal, they look forward to it and they find that that's been helping out a lot um, lately with horses and autistic children. There's Cooper with another patient. All right, animal therapy. It's been shown to improve emotional, psychological, and physical well-being. It decreases the loneliness, stress, and blood pressure and heart rate. And these all have been documented in many, many studies. Now, right now, there's a new approach to medical care, and it's in every type of medical care, physicians, hospitals. What you're trying to do is you want to heal the whole person. You're just not looking at one specific area. Say, I go into a hospital, and I have a problem with my liver. What they want to do is take not just looking at the liver, but they want to look at everything on your whole body um, to make sure what is affecting that liver, what is causing this. So there are a lot of hospitalists in, the, in um, hospitals now who oversee all the specialists so to make sure that there's nothing missed. Um, what they find is when these animals come in the room, for whatever reason they're having problems, be it um, stress, medical, emotional, they find that these animals take them away from that in the moment. And they get these patients to live in the moment and just focus on what's happening right there. And what it does, it, inc it increases their mood, their attitude, um, their outlook in life. Because a lot of these patients have been in the hospitals for years, and they don't know if they're ever going to get out. But to bring a dog into this area who would just be there, they don't judge, they don't talk, they're just there to rest on and to be pet, um, it makes a big difference for them. It kind of brings home to them. A lot of them will talk to me that they have pets at home, and they miss them, and they're no longer able to see them. So this kind of bridges a gap um, for that. Like we said, the touch of an animal reduce, releases endorphins, um, which causes the body to relax. Contact with these animals' warm bodies. You can feel the heartbeat. Their skin is very soft. And a lot of people will notice them, just the breathing of the animals, of their chest going up and down. Again, we talked about this, the shift focuses focuses patients' illness by distracting them from the current situation and helping them relax. Then they also have some physical therapy um, components of it. You know, people are going through physical therapy who've had a stroke. Um, they want them to go walking. They want them to squeeze a ball. They want them to throw something. A lot of times they don't want to do it. They're tired of it. They don't want to, they don't want to be there. But a lot of times what happens if you bring a dog into this situation, they'll throw the ball for their dog, for the dog, or it gives them some focus on not just to do it because it gets pretty boring. They'll pet the dog, get some more motions in the hand. Um, you know, if they want to walk, they'll say, if you can walk through this with the walker, we'll let you pet the dog. And it just gives them a little bit more positive encouragement throughout their therapy. Um, now, where is this used? It's been used in many, many areas. Hospitals, psychiatric populations, palliative care, 
correctional facilities. A big one is for war veterans and geriatrics. A friend of mine took that picture on my dock a few weeks ago. Uh, pretty good photographer. I could never do that. All right. So we're almost done with the history and how this works. There was the Housing and Urb Urban Recover Rural Recovery Act, where the government finally recognized the value of these therapy pets. And it sent a strong signal um, to the United States and its people that it recognized these importance of pets in certain people's lives. It focused on advocating accept acceptability of service dogs in public places. Now with some of the psychiatric patients, they found that it improves mental state by increasing socialization, behavioral motivation, and it gives them a sense of purpose. It helps depressed patients, um, you know, some humor. A dog gives unconditional love. It's not going to talk back. It's going to be there just for you. And they found that this leads to a decrease in anxiety. It gives them a longer attention span and has a much calming effect on these patients. Now, correctional facilities, you'll say, why are dogs in correctional facilities? What they found is um, there's this program called Puppy Behind Bars that's partnered with the Humane Society. And what they found is they bring these dogs in, and it's only for certain in inmates who have made certain goals and they've done certain things um, in the correctional institution. And these dogs are trained for law enforcement or to be service dogs. And what they found is that these um, prisoners are with these dogs 24 hours a day. So they get the best training they can ever get. Someone's with them every minute of the day. And these dogs come out really well trained. So the benefits for, for the prisoners is they receive and give unconditional love. And it also gives them a sense of that they might have done something bad previously, but I can still cr contribute to society. I can still do something and try to get, you know, get me out of this situation I was in. And they found that these dogs, too, once these people are released from prison, they're less likely to come back and be reincarcerated again. Um, we go to a lot of different events. This one was in our town for a uh, firefighter who passed away tragically. And there's a team of us who work together, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit. And they had a benefit hockey game for the firemen, where the firemen were playing the police department. And they asked us to come there just because it was going to be an emotional time for some of the participants and for the people in the crowd. And this is one of the dogs Cooper works with a lot called Gizmo. And uh, I think he's the cutest dog I've ever seen. He weighs about two pounds. <laughs> OK. Some of the other uses, um, assisted living in nursing home facilities, hospitals, disaster sites, and we're going to get into that a bunch because that's a big thing also. Funeral homes, schools, and libraries. We've been to a couple funerals where, for different reasons, it's a very emotional time. Well, they'll just have us stand there with the dog right outside the receiving line, and when people come out, the dog's there, and they can pet him, console him, talk to the dog. War veterans, um, it's a really, really big deal right now. Um, they go through so much psychological, emotion, and physical disruptions in their life that they have a hard time fitting back in. Now, I was going to touch base. I don't know how many people were at the AAO. I think it was three years ago for the awards luncheon. We had a speaker, Marcus Luttrell, and that's his dog right there. Marcus Luttrell was the individual who they made that movie Lone Survivor about. I don't know if anybody saw it. Mark Wahlberg played him. And it's an incredible story. Um, how he lived and survived, I don't know. And how he's going through his daily life, I have no idea. But uh, it was uh, at this awards luncheon, it was so in your face, it was so real that I think some people got a little bit scared about it. And he talked about you know, his life, how he's fitting back into society right now, and how if he didn't have his dog, he wouldn't be able to do this. And one of his points, too, that is kind of a take-home point, which he started his lecture late. Um, because we were giving out awards, and orthodontists tend to go over, and everything like that. We all like to speak. So when he got up there, the first thing he said is, I was given 45 minutes to speak. 
20 minutes of it has already been used. I'm only giving you a 25 minute speech. If I'm not on time or if I'm late to anything, the person next to me won't be standing there. So he said to me, the most important thing is being on time and being there for an individual. So a couple co quotes he has is, I wish every retired serviceman woman could have a service dog. He is my best friend and he's with me 24 hours a day. He talks about how he's those stressful days and he can't talk to anyone. You just want to kind of shut yourself off. But he said, I can bounce the ideas off the dog and he'll just sit there and listen and he won't argue with me. 60% um, of households have pets. They treat pets as part of their family. They name them, they clothe them, they speak to them every day. Pets, no matter what, give unconditional love. They're non-judgmental. They're the most loyal um, things out there and they're a confidant. My dad always talks about um, a joke. It's probably not the best joke to say, but if he, if he took my mom and the dog and locked him in a closet for an hour. He opened the door, who was gonna be happy to see him? The dog didn't care who was locked in that closet. He's just happy to see someone. Um, now when you're in the office, there's some perceived risks. First one is people being afraid of a dog. Um, we have some people at first who are deathly scared of dogs. And if that was an issue, I would take the dog, he has a bed behind our front desk. We would just place him there, and he would just lie there. There's some cultural beliefs also um, from different parts of the country where dogs are not respected and um, they just don't like them around in their area. Another big thing we had is people's allergies who come to the office. They say, if you have a dog here and, I'm, and I have allergies, I can't come to your office. What we found is that we have a hypoallergenic dog. It's a poodle mix. Any of those are usually hypoallergenic. We have one of our staff members who is allergic to anything, be it nuts, pollen, hay fever, and she gets these severe allergic reactions where she has to be hospitalized. For whatever reason, this dog is the only dog she's ever been, been able to be around where she doesn't have any reactions. However, if you did have a problem with a patient or something like that, we just bring the dog into another room so the dog isn't there for a while they're in the office. Um, fear of infection, sterility is another one in the office. I thought it was gonna actually be a big deal when we brought the dog in. People would say, well, this is supposed to be a sterile field. How can you have, full oh, fix that. How can you have an animal? How can you have an animal in this situation? So we did some research on it, and I didn't, at first, when we had the dog there for about the first five years, People want to do stories about them in the newspaper and in the, in, on the news. I told them I don't want anything done because this is the part of the issue I had that if someone wants to complain, even if it's not one of my patients, I don't know what the state would do. But through it all, um, the type of office we're operating on isn't 100% sterile. We're not a surgeon's office. We're not um, you know, an operating room. I kind of think of us almost as a restaurant, but we do have to be more sterile and have stricter um, guidelines than a restaurant. We haven't had one person um, who said to us, um, you know, you can't have this dog here because of these issues. Could it come up? I'm sure it could, but I think once the dog gets in there and people realize what it's doing and why it's there, we really haven't had any issues. All of our instruments are bagged. We don't take them out till we're at the um, treatment chair. So, you know, and it's just, um, we follow all the proper precautions, but there is a dog in the room. And the other one is perceived liability. What happens if someone's dog, you say, what happens if the dog bites a patient? Or if the dog pulls the dog's tail or hits them really hard and the dog bites them? Well, part of the training is you have to make sure your dog, no matter what situation, would never growl or get upset. Um, during the test, they pet them heavy, they push them, they drop books by them, um, they want to see if they really get spooked, they walk around him with wheelchairs, walkers, make all the noises you might have in a medical facility, and they just want to make sure the dog's comfortable with it. Also, if you're registered through Pet Partners, they do have, it's either one million or two million dollar uh, insurance policy they give you 
as being part of this organization if there is a, ever is a problem. Um, little research has been done in the uh, field of dentistry, dentistry about having these therapy off, off animals in their office. And we find that some of the little kids, he has a bed behind the desk, and some of the little kids just love him, hug him, pet him. They won't leave him alone. Um, and every now and then he puts his tail down and just walks behind the desk. That's a safe place. But a lot of patients or the younger kids just go up and lie in the bed with them. Okay, I'm going to uh, skip the talk about the dog for a minute. I'm going to go over four cases, and then we're going to get back to the dog and kind of do our story of him being in the office and why he's there. Okay, this is a typical um, cleft palate patient we see. We usually, sometimes we see them when they're weeks old, sometimes we see them when they're a month old, sometimes we see them not till they're 10 or 12 years old, it, it ranges. This patient came to see us, um, I think they were about two weeks old, and you can see it has a unilateral, unilateral cleft lip and palate. And what we do, what we see these patients is, what we wanna do is get them ready for the lip surgery. So if you see here, we don't use this anymore, but this is what we used to exclusively use. We take a little bonnet, take some elastic tape or elastic thread, put some Velcro on it, and what you do is you put it over the lip. And the purpose of this is it, the pressure would bring the lip back to a norm, more normal position, so when the surgeon went in to do the repair, there's no tension, there's no um, forces trying to pull it apart. And we've also found sometimes it does help with the palatal shelves to bring them a little bit closer together. So here's the patient, you know, at uh, seven months. Here's the patient at eight months. Not much a difference, but you can see these, they're not kind of protruding quite as much as they were. Here's the patient another month later. This visit, he was not too happy. Every now and then, they don't want to wear this. They, we tell the parents, the patient's going to cry, the baby's going to cry. It's not going to like it, but it'll get over it in a day or so, you know, or a few hours, they'll get used to it. And here he is once he calmed down a little bit. Here's the same patient um, wearing the bonnet, and you can definitely see how much closer these segments are now. Here he is at three and a half months, and you can see the lip has been brought together a lot more. They don't always cry when they're in office, but a lot of times when they see me, they start to cry. <laughs> um, and he's ready to go for his surgery now. Here he is right after his surgery at five months. So to go from the beginning to five months to get this change is pretty, pretty remarkable. Here he is at nine months. Now he's leading a normal life of a young baby. He, people aren't looking at him when he's walking around with his mother in the stroller. Um, school situations, um, preschool. Kids just have an effect when they're younger. They notice something's different, and sometimes they don't respond well to it, the other children. And it, you know, it can give the, these patients, too, kind of a um, social, psychological issues. Here's this patient at 21 months. Now he's developing to be a character. You can really see his personality. Here he is at 35 months. Then we jump to, he's four years old, and every time he comes in, he's got this swag to him, he's got this attitude, he thinks he's the man. He is the man, but his mom says that all the time. Here he is at five years old. Now you can see it's gonna become an orthodontic case. There's gonna be some complications. He's got a class three bite, a twinning tooth there, um, negative overjet, but that's something we can deal with as orthodontists. If this patient was allowed to go on with that cleft, for a long period of time, A, we talked about the so social issues he would have, B, the eating issues, C, um, the um, uh, social issues, psychological issues, and it makes him from growing up to having a, a relatively negative experience, or he could, depending on the child, to having a positive sp experience, and I think it changes this boy's, this boy's life for the rest of his life. Okay, and here he is when he's nine. We're just again about to start to treat him now. Um, the one thing with a lot of these cleft patients is we want to expand them and get the bone graft before the canine comes in. I'm not going to get into 
a lot of information that sometimes we expand them a little bit earlier depending on their dentition, sometimes we expand them a little bit later. So there he is from eight weeks old to nine years old, and I think you can see an amazing difference in that case. Um, these two patients were adopted from China, and we got to know them really well. One of the sisters had a cleft. We were seeing them for a few years, and at first when they came over, they didn't speak any English. And my dad loved them, and they bonded with my dad right away. So one day in school, they had to make a project to make a bow tie. So they made the bow tie, and they brought it in for my dad. They wanted him to have it. All right, this is a very interesting patient we saw at the age of eight. You look at him, you're like, he's class two, he's got a large overjet, long lower face height, something weird's going on down there. So we take a medical history, we're talking to the parents and the patient. He had an extremely aggressive cancer at a young age. So what they did is they had to section off the mandible on one side and then place a rib to act as his mandible um, on that side. And you tend not to see this, especially at ages this young. So here's x-ray. Um, we've got some you know, dental issues, which aren't a big deal. This is the rib they use to reconstruct his mandible in the condyle right there. For some reason, and I have no idea, I've never spoken to any other dentists that work with him. At the time, they thought they had to put some implants in to give him some occlusion there, which I think was a pretty big mistake. Um, you're going to see these are going to um, relatively intrude you know, over his life. And once these are in there, there's no way you can get these out. That's mandible, the rib is so, so thin right there that they're there for the rest of his life. But again, not a big deal. It's something we can deal with. This is him right before we started him. And again, you can see um, total class two, short lower facial height, mandibular setback, large overjet, um, you know, a bunch of different issues going on in there. Um, here's his lateral ceph. And his, here's his pan right before we started treatment for him. Okay, so we put braces on, we start to level and align him. This is when he's 15 years old. And you can see, um, this is the side right there that they had the implants placed and you could always see how infraocclusal they are. Um, he's got a large overjet, um, still class two, short lower face height. So the parents started to talk to me and said, you know what, I don't like this lower jaw. I want to bring it forward. So I thought about it a lot, and I said, you know what, that's kind of a risky procedure to uh, do a mandible to bring it forward on a patient whose one side of their jaw is a rib. So what we did is we met with the surgeon um, who moved from us, which is, we're sad about, he moved to another location in the United States. But this guy did a couple of those cases I'll show you. And he said, you know what, I think I can do it. So went through all the informed consent, the risks, everything like that. So there's his, you know, just when the teeth are aligned. Here he is right after the surgery. Now I think this guy went from being a, you know, everyday average kid to, I think this guy could be a model. Again, if something happened to his hair, I don't know, egg beater or something like that. But um, you can see they have the scar um, extra orally. They don't usually do that, but this case was so difficult that they felt they had to do an outside approach in. Again, there's his lateral ceph, and you can see the plates in there from the surgery. And again, right there. So they did a bilateral. Here he is a few years later. Um, he's 17, and you can see right here, we've got that infra occlusion that nothing's touching on that side, but there's not much we can do about it. Again, his pan at that point. Everything seems really stable. Here he is one year later. And again, um, I think aesthetically, it was the surgeon who did all this work. It had nothing to do with us. But I think the result we have here is pretty tremendous. Here he is four years later, and you can see what they did is they telescoped, telescoped those crowns, you know, after he was done growing to give him some occlusion on that side. Now, this individual was a really, really special guy, the most outgoing guy you'd meet. He could, you know, one of those guys you'd meet from the movies. And he went off to college, and lo and behold, we didn't know it. He's really not supposed to play any contact sports because of that rib there. He decided to play rugby. 
So um, I was playing rugby, his mom calls me um, and says, he had a really bad hit. Um, he's knocked out and he was in a coma for two days. I said, oh my God. Um, long story short, he ended up coming out of the coma. Everything was okay. Jaw wasn't damaged. But I said to him, I met down with him, I said, you are not allowed to play any contact sports for the rest of your life. Yeah? Um, we have, and I'm going to show you a case where we did do it, but they weren't sure about distracting a rib. Um, so, and the surgeon thought that this was just a cleaner approach instead of putting distractors in to get the vectors and um, just some of the situations. This surgeon does do a bunch of distraction. I'm going to show you a case with that also, but a great question. Um, so this guy, we haven't seen him probably in about 12 years. He was treated probably about... We started about 16, 17 years ago, but um, he's one of those guys, if he ever's in town, he stops by the office just to say hi. And he went from there to there. And you would think, how is his function with the rib as a condyle? A lot of people ask that question. He's had no issues um, so far, and he had to put in when he was probably about, I want to say five or six. So um, he's had no issues you know, with opening, closing, excursion movements, pain anything like that. And again, I attribute this to the surgeon. Okay, uh, our staff every year for Halloween requests we dress up. I don't like to dress up. They kind of force me to do it. But every year we come up with a theme. And this year it was kind of a sock hop, grease 50s theme. Everyone gets dressed up, even Cooper. And uh, Cooper always has the best outfits. Um, here he is as kind of a greaser, and on Christmas, or right around Christmas, they dress him up as Santa Claus. Um, here's the third patient I'm going to show you, and this one's a little bit different also. He came to us, his history was he was hit in work on the side of the face. All of a sudden, his lower jaw started skewing to one side. So they didn't know what was quite going on. They saw someone, and they decided that he had a tumor on his condyle. So what they did is they took the tumor off, left the condyle where it was. About six months later, it started to shift over again to that side. So for whatever reason, the surgeon who saw him decided to take the upper jaw and move it to match the lower jaw, which is kind of opposite of what you would ever do. So when we got to see him, his upper jaw was off and his lower jaw was off. And if you look at his x-ray, there's the tumor right there, okay? Um, you can see some of the stuff from the previous surgeries. So, you know, we met with our surgeon and said, What's, you know, what should we do about it? And his opinion was the best thing to do was resect that condyle. Kind of, it's come back twice. Right now it wasn't, um, it didn't have any pathology, but he thought it could change, and it could change any time. So you're gonna see here what they did is here six months into the treatment, we just decompensated him, you know, made him worse. And now we're gonna go from the surgery. What we did, and again, this case was done probably about 14 years ago. At the time, this was kind of new. Um, now it's just standard. But it was a company called Medical Modeling where they could take a CT scan and produce an exact replica of the patient's jaw, face, teeth, nerve canals. They could show the nerves in there for the surgeon. And the real reason we did this for the surgeon was right up here, you really can't see it, but that um, tumor, he wanted to have an idea before he went into the surgery how, where he's gonna have to resect that jaw and how he's gonna have to make that rib look. He's a real artist. Here it is at the time of the surgery, and you can see the size of the tumor is exactly the same as it was on the model. Here he is four months after his surgery, and he's looking really, really good. Again, um, chin is still off and maxilla's off. The reason that happened is the patient said, I don't want to touch the maxilla. I've had enough surgery. I want to be over and done with. I just want to have a normal function and be able to um, you know, go on with the rest of my life. So that's why the jaws are a little bit off and still a little asymmetric. I don't necessarily blame him. Um, he's been through, this was his fourth surgery, one, two, no, third surgery. Um, so here's x-ray, and that's the rib right there. 
And now people will say, you know, how is this function with the rib? People say you resect that condyle. You know, you could have major problems the rest of your life. This guy's doing really, really well, and I'm going to show you some long-term follow-up on him because he does audiovisual, and I have him do stuff at my house, alarms, cameras, all that kind of stuff. So I've got to see him for a very relatively long period of time. And he says, you know, he has really no problems. Every now he gets a little crepitus. He says it's not sore. He can eat. You know, lateral movements, excursions are all pretty good. So here he is at the finish, and I think the finish is unbelievable, with the, considering you have a rib in there. And this is all due to the surgeon. His name was Joe Shin. Uh, he was in Connecticut, moved to Massachusetts. Now he's up in New Hampshire at uh, Dartmouth. And he's an amazing, amazing, he's a plastic surgeon. I forgot to say that. Um, really does not have much dental training or background, but he can do stuff that I don't think a lot of surgeons can do. Uh, here is his pan, and again, you can see that right there, the rib. Here is the end of that rib. You show two now. Yep. Does he ever get cartilage on the end of it? Or you know, I don't know. That's a great question. I should, you know, ask the surgeon or maybe some of the other people who spoke here would know better. Um, I don't know if it depends where they shape it or if they leave some cartilage at the end of the rib. You know, I'm not really sure about that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it does. Yeah. This one? And this is before we had cone beams or anything like that. You know, we, they did do a CT scan for the patient. I don't have a copy of it. But, um, you know, if you had that stuff at your, at your um, disposal, I think it would have made it a little bit easier for the surgeon. And you can see he did a real nice job in shaping that with the condyle right there. fits right in the fossa. Uh, here he's three years later. You know, still looking great. Um, his dentist keeps telling him, I want to change that crown. I want to change that crown. And he said, you know, I don't want anything else done. I'm done. I don't want dentistry if I can help it. You know, going for my checkups. But just make sure everything's doing well. Here he is six years later. Hair changed a little bit, got a beard. But um, again, the occlusions held up well. Um, most of my cases don't hold up that well. Never mind, you know, having a rib in there as a, um, you know, a condyle ramus. Patient who just got her braces off with Cooper. Now I'm going to show you one more case, then we're going to get into more about Cooper, kind of the meat of it. This patient was referred to us by his... Um, Pediatrician. Actually, the pediatric dentist referred it to the pediatrician, and the pediatrician referred it to us. Pediatric dentist, the patient came in and said, you know, this kid hasn't lost any of his teeth. You know, he's eight and a half. Something's going on. So they sent him to the pediatrician. The pediatrician says, I don't know what's really going on. So they sent him to our office. As soon as I saw this patient, I immediately recognized this patient has Cruzon syndrome. Lower face set back, exophthalmus with the eyes, bulging eyes out really mid-face deficient. So to me, the issue really wasn't the teeth at all in this case. We had to do something to help him. Um, here's, and these are all the x-rays. Yeah, this one's uh, 16 years old, so we treated him for a long time. Here he is, and we sent him to Yale, sent him to, Yale to have a workup. And their findings was he did have Cruzon syndrome. He had a mutation of one of his genes. He had craniosynostosis which meant the skull was fused and it was not growing. He had mid-face hypoplasia, severe sleep apnea, but the biggest issue was he had optic pro pro proptosis, and they said the nerve of the eye, because the pressure was so high in the brain, could, be, um, could die and he could go blind. So something had to be done pretty quick for this patient. There was no time to figure things out. They said it could happen any day, because with the cranial synostosis, brain's growing, Skull doesn't move, eyes are back, set, you know, um, all the pressure there on the nerves it was going to be a major problem. So again, this is one of those models we did at the time from that company. And here this is. And um, again, this was the same surgeon, plastic surgeon. What he did is he went through, made all the cuts he needed to do before the surgery. Then he had his distraction devices that he wanted to bend before the surgery. 
because this is going to do, I've only seen two of these. This is going to be an internal distraction, not an external. For all the mid-face deficiencies I've ever seen, you kind of wear the halo or the, um, the mask where you have elastics attached to the teeth to um, bring the upper face where you would like it. And the better thing about that is you control the vectors. If something's not going in the right direction, you can move it by the elastics. With this, if you're not right on the money, the, jaws, the whole head is going to one side or the other. Here he is with the devices in place. Um, you know, you can see him, he's got them, you know, out of his head there. However, it's much more aesthetic than wearing the halo. It's, um, it doesn't tend to get caught as much and there's not as much um, social problems. I think kids would be, once you've got that whole thing on your face, kids are a little bit more to notice it. You do notice this also. So what it was, it was a monoblock internal distraction. So every day they're turning those distractors equally. And you could see on this x-ray, I don't know if there's a better pointer here. Let's see if this one works. Um, you can see here, that's the amount of of we've distracted that mid-face forward, okay? So now, the theory behind this is when you usually do a mid-face um, type of surgery or a, um, or when you have the elastics to pull the jaw forward, the good news about this is once this heals, this is gonna be all of his own bone. There's not gonna have to be any bone packed in there. Um, we're not gonna have some of the um, issues of instability. And you can see this was from the craniosynostosis right up there too. Okay, here's like six months later, and that does not look like the same child. Um, he's growing normally. Um, again, we talked about some of the social, psychological interactions at school. Um, I think this has changed his life for the better. And people will say, well, you did this so early. Um, what's the effect on it? Is it gonna have to be redone? The answer is most of these patients that we've treated, um, we've had a lot of distraction cases. Most of them hold up really well. We've had one or two where later on they have to go in and they have to tweak it or do a little bit of advancement or something like that. However, these surgeries are very minor compared to some of the other surgeries that he would have needed if he didn't have any work done previously. And I know also some of the lecturers talked about the muscle sling. Um, when you're doing this at an early age, that muscle tends to develop with the jaw, with growth. The nerves aren't as stretched. So um, I think there's some benefits from that, that aspect of it also. Um, here's his uh, lateral ceph. All the devices have been removed. His bone's forming in there. Here he is a year later. You know, really cute kid. Um, dentist still keeps calling me saying those teeth aren't in. What are we gonna do? I'm nervous. The pediatric dentist said, I'm not worried about those teeth, I don't care. Um, this kid's had some major improvements. So what we did after a while, um, again, now you can see, just a normal lateral ceph, all of his bone in there. Teeth still aren't in, um, super, super delayed. So what I decided to do just to appease some people, and I spoke to the mom and the patient about it, I just took a little laser and just took off a little bit of the tissue there to see what would happen. And lo and behold, after this slide, again, another one. The teeth started to erupt. So um, some pretty amazing results from this. And if you look at his pan, he's got some issues. He uh, carries, he doesn't really keep his teeth clean, um, seriously crowded. Um, but again, I think we did the major work at that point. Here he is when he's 12. He's, we got some teeth taken out, some cavities filled. And here he is from here to this point. Now, the story about him is we started to treat him up until he was about 15 years old. We are doing some expansion. We hadn't seen him much. He kind of disappeared, which is really too bad. We call his house, say, listen, he needs to get in here. We need to finish this. He had a lot of issues. And there were some family issues with the mother and father. Um, and he'd disappear for a year at a time. Then, a long story short, father gets arrested, goes to jail. 
Mother's just taking care of him. So it gets even tougher for him to come in. Then he decided to do something. I don't even know what it is. I don't want to know. He ended up going to jail for two years. So we had to take all of his appliances off, and he just went on his way. So he came back about two years ago. It must have been about 10 years after we'd done all this, 15 years. And, um, you know, he said he wants to go back in treatment. He wants to finish it. Facially, I don't have a picture, and I should have taken one. He is a little bit mid-face deficient now. Um, but overall, he looks pretty darn good. You know, if you wanted to make him perfect, you would probably do some sort of a jaw for surgery, a Lafort or something like that. But again, he's real sketchy about coming in. We told him to come in for records, didn't, sh didn't show up. So I'm really not sure what's going to happen to this individual, but I think we did him a big service. Now, people were talking yesterday about Invisalign and different things with it. Is it good? Is it bad? Does it work? We get some of these magazines that we subscribe to for just about animals, um, service animals, therapy dogs. And then we got this one. From, this is from Tufts University School of Medicine. Okay? So when we're looking at it, I'm just reading it and it goes, hmm, braces. Yes, really braces. Orthodontic care in puppyhood could save some dogs from a lifetime pain and complications. So I say, okay, let's look at it. And they have this article talking about braces for dogs, why a dog should need them, um, you know, the teeth can go in the wrong direction, cause pain, da 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 da. And then they talk, sometimes they'll use an inclined plane, they just use them for three or four months. I don't know how anybody in my hands, I think dad did it once, but um, could ever work on a dog with braces. But they're talking about it here. Then the next line of the article, which goes even further right here, an Invisalign-like options. Now these are for pets, okay? From some dogs, depending on the exact nature of their problem, it's possible to use invisible, removable retainers to realign their teeth rather than attach composite material to the upper canines for two to three months. Then they say it's made by a company called Petaline. So I'm thinking, all right, what is this Petaline? So I look it up last night. Here's their Facebook page. Um, it only has 18 followers. Um, I don't think, I have no idea, our dog would not wear this. He'd pop them out, he'd chew them. I have no idea how these work. But their idea is to make these clear retainers. You can see it doesn't really fit well, but to go over the teeth, move the teeth, I guess, little by little. So it's not just in orthodontics and teeth movement. Someone came up with this idea saying, let's use it in pets. I don't think it's gonna be very effective. I don't think it's gonna work well, but uh, some different ideas there with everything. All right, now we're going to get back to our point with Cooper. This is probably the best part of the lecture. Um, what happened was Cooper was a surprise gift from one of my cousins. Um, she showed up one day and said, I've got you a birthday gift. My birthday was four months ago. I said, I don't need a gift. I'm an adult now. What are you doing? She comes down with this little puppy with a ribbon around it. And I said, it was the cutest little thing, but he was wild. I said to her, what am I going to do with this? I'm at work. I go away a lot of the weekends. She promised me, I'll take care of him when you're away, and when you're at work, I'll watch him. Lo and behold, she moved out of town, out of state, two months later. So I love this dog. However, again, um, my vet thought we had to put him on medication. He was so crazy. My dad and myself would go to a meeting. We'd leave him with my mom for the night. My mom would call us crying. I don't know what to do. He won't stop barking, biting, tearing things up. And, you know, at first I thought he was really about, you know, kind of like he had the devil inside of him. So I worked with him about 10 months. I had, um, I went to training classes, two of them. Every dog graduates. He didn't deserve to graduate. All the dogs there were um, sitting at the end, listening to the commands. He was barking, jumping up and down, going crazy, pulling on his leash. So I had a private trainer come to the house. I just kept working with him. And one night I woke up, he was a completely different dog. I don't know what happened, divine intervention, whatever it was. So the problem was we'd go to work every day and he'd be home by himself most of the day. So I'd have a dog walker come, um, take care of him. If I could, I'd go home during lunch, walk him, play with him. And then after a while, if, whenever you leave him, I was going to bring him to this meeting. I brought him last year to uh, Asheville. And he's great. Travel on the plane. He'll sit here in the meetings on our lap. You won't even know he's there. Problem is, if you leave him in the room, in the hotel room, 
He hears people outside. He does not want to be left alone. He's with people almost 24 hours a day. So he lets out these cries, these um, barks, these heart wrenching cries. And last year at the meeting, we had to get three nights, not a babysitter, but a dog sitter to sit in the room. We called the hotel and said, do you have anyone who could sit with our dog while we go out to dinner? And we did, and we paid her probably as much as a babysitter. And the dog, we'd come back, and the dog was just sitting on her lap sleeping. Um, so out of desperation, what I did is we have a full basement in our office, um, and we also have our own personal office. It's not that big, but it has a glass door in it you can see in it, and I'd keep them in there. So what he did is patients would play with him, and he escaped a couple times. What he did is he immediately jumped on a patient's lap. And that is no training whatsoever that I had to do. He was born with it. I don't know how or why. And he calms the patients, he calms the parents. When the parents walk into the room, in the waiting room, if they've got a bad day, the dog senses it. And he'll go up to him and jump on their lap and put his head down. Um, we realized patients loved him. Um, he was a key part of the office. But I said, how can we keep him here legally? So I did a lot of research um, on the line and everything like that. And that's when I discovered Pet Partners. And um, we went through the whole course and got him certified. Now, what was the course? It, the course considered, uh, consisted of training of the handler and the animal um, going through a school. What they do is they had uh, classes at a, at a dog training place about 30 minutes from our house. The problem they were given was every time during office hours. So I called up the woman who was giving it, and she lived about an hour away from us. And I said, is there any way I can teach you to do this? Can I do this with you privately? And she said, yes. So we would travel up to her house once a week. Um, normally, it takes about eight sessions. Um, it took us probably about five or six. Um, the dog just excelled. We didn't have any other people with there, so she was able to focus a little bit more on the dog. So every two years, myself, dad, and the dog, you have to get recertified. So once you're certified, you're not certified for life. Um, and, and like we said before about the training and the certification, they just basically want to know the dog listens to commands. He'll sit. You could walk away. He won't come up here. You know, he'll, he'll behave. He'll never rip something out of someone's hand. No matter what, he will not growl, show his teeth, vicious, anything like that. So he passed with flying colors. Now what we found is that family loves love him. He pacifies so many patients. Um, in this photo right here, it's a family of kids. We're treating one of them now. Actually, we just started the other. They look forward to coming in to see this dog more than anything. Their mother is deathly afraid of dogs. The dog runs to them. They bring him in treats. And anyone who brings in Cooper a treat, he remembers. Someone came in seven years ago. If they brought him in a treat, they walk in the door, he makes a beeline for them. So every time they come in, the mother's, get away, get away, get away. So she has to go to the opposite side of the room where her kids are so the dog won't come over to her. Um, also something I want to say is Cooper not only is trained to be in office, but he's trained our whole staff, the postman, the FedEx man, the UPS man. Every time they come in, the dog has his paws up like this. He'll see the truck coming down the street, and he knows. And they give him a treat every day. And he'll do tricks for it. He'll do whatever they say. Um, patients, a lot of patients bring him in treats. And at some points, I've got a limit to it because he'll just eat treats all day and uh, won't eat any of his food. But what we found is with a lot of these cranial facial patients, um, they had what we call white coat syndrome, that they've seen so many doctors over their life. They always say it's not going to hurt. Um, you're going to have no problem. It's going to be easy. Almost every time they get a needle, they have surgery. They're lied to. So when they come to our office, they think the same thing's going to happen. So what we're fortunate to do is have Cooper there. Cooper will come over and jump on their lap. It relaxes this patient. It lets them think about the moment right here and not what's happened previously. And my dad calls him that he's a warm, fuzzy Valium. Here he is. This is one of the local dentist's wife's. Every now and then, she'll make Cooper a, a plate of homemade treats. And as soon as she comes in, he's immediately all over her. Now, a little bit what Cooper's done in the past. In our town, I think it was about five years ago, there was a terrible tragedy where a student asked another student to go to the prom the day before the prom. 
the uh, female said, no, I don't want to go with you. This student ended up stabbing her in the hallway and she passed away. So it was terrible trauma for our community. It still is right now. And what we had is they brought in these therapy dogs. And also I'm going to talk a little bit. Cooper is also a canine first responder dog that there's only about 12 in the state. So what they did is they brought us in for about two weeks and every day I would go into the school. Cooper's job was just to sit there. Patients would lay, or students would lay on him. Um, they'd have him sitting on their lap. They could talk to Cooper. They found him almost as effective as a psychologist. Um, because the dog doesn't talk back, it's just there for you, it's in the moment. And it was pretty amazing on what these dogs could do. Um, and he not only consoled the students, he made them feel safe. And he also made some of the teachers feel safe. Because after something like this happens, nobody wants to go to school. You know, you've had this tragedy right in the hallway. And a lot of people saw it, that um, they don't want to go back to this school. And I wouldn't blame them. And they're afraid every time they go in. So these dogs made a big difference. And um, afterwards, there's been a couple ceremonies. I'll show it. But this was one of the memorials they made. Um, her favorite color was purple. And because of this, the state, um, not Malloy Dad, but the state, um, gave out some citations. And they gave out one to Cooper and a bunch of other therapy dogs who were involved in this. And the state and the citation signed by the uh, secretary, I don't know, speaker of the house and the secretary of the state. And they had a little ceremony. And these are a bunch of the dogs that Cooper works with. Um, there's one here called Spartacus. That's an Akita. The thing is huge. And um, he's one of the main dogs that's known around town. But here's a bunch of the other ones. And then they All right, Carrie, doing thank a you. Milford's story. Board of Aldermen meeting went to the dogs Monday night, and these are special dogs we're talking about. Mayor Ben Blake honored Spartacus and other therapy dogs that responded to the fatal stabbing of Jonathan Law High School student Marin Sanchez back in April. The dog's handler said recognition from the city was nice, but it's not why they step in when tragedy strikes. Our biggest honor is when we see a student and they say thank you, or see a teacher or a parent and say, you really helped my child. A total of 55 therapy dogs, along with their handlers, were honored for their service. And the person right there who did, who is um, the newscaster, he's a patient of ours. We treated his two children. And another just little added information in there, um, his partner now on the local news for the state, it's gotten pretty big, is a patient we treated. Um, she won Miss Connecticut and went on to the um, Miss America pageant. And she came in with her crown and took pictures with the dog I was looking for this morning because I forgot to put him in. I couldn't find him. But my dad always said her whenever she would come in the office, she goes, if you win, the first thing you have to say is I want to thank my orthodontist. Um, but uh, she didn't win. She won Miss Congeniality. She had a great time. But now she's on their co-host, the morning news, her and our old, you know, and our patient. Okay, another thing we're involved with too is we weren't the first responders when this happened, but in Newtown, Connecticut, I'm sure everyone in the knows in the room that there was one of the worst tragedies you can ever imagine where uh, someone came in with an assault rifle and just started shooting. One of the students who passed away, parents, um, these therapy dogs were in the school, they're still there, you know, years later, and said she saw the benefit these dogs had and she does, um, her daughter's name was Charlotte, so she came up with this concept calling it Charlotte's Litter. And she just um, developed a foundation to help with therapy dogs, to train them, to support other organizations, to help put these dogs in situations where they can help people. Um, a couple other things Cooper's involved with is there's one called Pause to Read. Our local library, once a month, has a session where the dogs come in and people sign up to read to them. And I don't know if many people have heard about these programs or not, but um, the dog will sit there, the kids will read to them, they'll lay on them. They found that dogs are totally non-judgmental, they're not gonna correct them, they're just there to listen. And they found that a lot of these students will read to the dogs where they might not read to an individual. So um, I've seen it do some pretty amazing things. And here he is in one of the sessions with just a couple different patients. Uh, or not patients, but people in the library. And again, he'll just lie there, the kids read to him, and uh, it's a pretty amazing thing to see. Cooper at our local hospital, we have one in town. Um, he's kind of a mascot there. 
I used to go every Friday. I haven't been for four or five months and I need to go back there. Just time gets hard. I wish I had more time in the day. But he's got his own official tag and um, we go around to see patients. And all he does is we'll go up to the floor and ask the nurse or whoever, you know, who would like to see Cooper today? They'd say, go to room five. Go to room five, Cooper jumps on their bed and puts his head down. And what we found is that, I talked about a little of this about before, but it brings back patients' memories of their dogs, if they've had a dog. It takes them out of what they're thinking about, the longevity of their problems. It puts them in the moment, and that they can see and they can pet this dog. And um, it just makes them in a better mood. The other thing is the nurses and doctors absolutely love it too. I think sometimes they almost look forward to seeing the dog more than the patients. We've had a few articles done on our dog. Um, again, this isn't the reason we do it, but patients post pictures of him on Facebook. He's pretty much known around our town and the town before it. Um, wherever he goes, they know the dog. We'll be walking in the middle of town. Someone will stop and say, oh, is that Cooper? Or we'll be walking downtown and there's a post, uh, we'll see our postman you know, a mile away. Cooper recognizes the truck, starts pulling towards it. He gets out and gives Cooper a treat. Um, it's really, really amazing. And that was just a little bit about you know, Cooper's daily stuff that he does in the office. And I can tell you, not that we got him for this reason or for any particular reason, but we're fortunate. My dad's been practicing in town over 50 years, and people know us. Um, but once we got this dog, it's a whole nother ball game. Um, people come in, they don't care about us, they just want to see the dog. And I don't blame them. Um, I'm just, we're almost done here. I'm going to talk a bit, a little bit about these canine first responders. In our state, it was one of the first states, because a bunch of bad stuff happened with Newtown, a couple of the schools, that they found that these dogs can help the people who have been through this tragedy, but they also, the, the firemen, the policemen, the first responders, the people in the ambulance, they have seen some awful, awful things. And they need help just as much as the people who had this happen to. So a person in that, actually Milford developed this organization, has got approval from our state. It's now, he brought it to Boston, Massachusetts. They're working on one in Delaware. So it's kind of expanding. And what the pur purpose of it is, it's a psychological trauma stress management group. Um, it's for critical incidents, and it helps to bridge the gap between traumatic events and connection to some of these mental health services. It jump starts the restoring of a person's emotional and cognitive equilibrium. And we all had to be trained. I had to take weeks of classes in um, psychosocial support, 
assisting victims of disaster, catastrophe, crisis, or violence. And what they found is it helps foster a resilience of the communities and individuals as well as the police, firemen, EMS, and safety personnel. So they've found that a lot of these people when they're taken away from the tragedy where they were the first responders, it's kind of almost coming home from the war, they are traumatized for the rest of their life. And they found that these dogs can make a big difference. Um, here he is in Sandy Hook. Every year they have a 5K, and this is the town where it happened in Newtown. And the firemen every year request some of these dogs. Uh, again, we weren't there initially. We've only been there a couple times. The dogs that were there um, did an amazing job. But he goes there once in a blue moon, and they request him to walk with the firemen in this event. And here he is uh, right there with some of the other dogs. He works with Spartacus, um, Rocky, and the firemen request these dogs to walk with them on the 5K every year. And thank you. Excuse me, are there any questions? Mike. Mike. Uh, has there been any discussion of using Barry Grayson's technique with nasal field or molding? Mm -hmm. or, uh, Some of these cleft cases. Diagnosis? Yeah, there's been a lot of research done on it. The surgeons we work with it, we've done it once or twice. And again, this is just from our experience. It's not scientific data or not. But our, the surgeons we've worked with have said that it's so labor intensive and over a long period of time, they don't see a huge benefit from it. That doesn't mean to say it's good or it's bad. If it works, you should definitely use it. It's just in our hands, it's not something we've really done. Yes? Do you know of any other orthodontists who have yeah. dog as part two? Um, would the size of the dog mm -hmm. make a difference? For example, will a lab be not? Mm -hmm. Yep, those are all excellent questions. Sure. Um, do you know any other offices who have a therapy dog? And does the size of the dog um, make a difference in the office? The first part of it is do we know any offices that have therapy dogs? I know of definitely two, probably three, who've come to our office and see what our dog does. And they've got them um, in their office now doing the same sort of things Cooper does. Um, so I think it's going to spread, and I think more of the word gets out there, it's going to even spread more. There's a pediatric dentist in our area who people can make an appointment to come in when the dog's there. So they'll bring do the dog in for special appointments or if a patient's very nervous or something of that nature. Um, and I think you're going to see these dogs and other animals incorporated to every field of medicine on what's going on. Uh, the second question, the size of the dog. We didn't pick out Cooper. Um, he was a surprise gift. I didn't know what size he was going to be, anything. But any dog can do it. Um, we work with some dogs that are you know, 120 pounds. I've got some that are three pounds. It's just if you have a really large dog, the dog's obviously not going to jump on the patient's laps. But it could sit there in the waiting room with them. It can go and greet the patients by the chairs. So you know, really any size of dog will work. You know, If a dog isn't hypoallergenic, it's still OK. But I think you'd have a little bit more of an issue um, with some of the patients and parents. What is your protocol for cleft palate patients? Um, you know, it really depends. It can be different um, for every patient. There's really not a cookbook book approach, but I would say um, it depends when we see the patient, how young they are, at what level we see them. Um, if we see them before the lips closed, we use this taping technique to bring the lip closer again, not that bonnet. Um, and then from there, we'll watch them, depending when teeth are coming in, um, jaw relationships, that kind of thing. And the most important thing is to get that width right, because um, a lot of them are narrow in width and have a crossbite. And you want to get the bone graft done before the canines are going to erupt. So I see that's the biggest timing from it. And then after you do that, we just sit and wait and watch most of them until they get their permanent teeth in the mouth. A lot of them need um, the forts later on. They need additional surgeries. But it's kind of a watch and wait game. 
and see what happens once you get past that bone graft. Do you do the expansion at a young age also, before um, or after the bone sure. graft? Sure. Well, we do always do the expansion before the bone graft, because if you do the bone graft before the expansion, if you expand it, sometimes it's not going to want to stay. You can uh, develop dehiscences, things, other things can happen. And um, we do the expansion ourselves. We do in timing of it. Again, I would say is depends when those canines are coming in. Some patients I end up doing it younger than I would normally think I would, and some a little bit older. Um, if I could, I'd like to do it a little bit older, just because then they seem to be able to tolerate it a little bit more. They've been to our office a lot. They're a lot more comfortable with us. So it's not like they're coming in right away or putting this thing in the roof of their mouth where they already have a problem with the roof of their mouth. Are, are you using a reverse head you're at a young age, or are you waiting until the, the growth is finalized and do a surgical procedure to advance the maxilla? Yep. We rarely use a reverse headgear. Um, there's studies out there that say they're great. Um, I've read them. We've used a couple in our office, and again, this is all anecdotal. Um, we found that patient, A, to get the patient to wear it's pretty difficult. We had one patient that was super motivated who wore it. We got into a perfect relationship. I overdid it, and then they grew out of it. And a lot of these patients are going to need surgery no matter what we do. So if they're developing, you know, a little bit mid-face deficient, you know, class three, most of them will just let them go that way. And then later on, we'll prepare him for surgery. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I answer that question? Can you slow it a little bit? George I think Michael. I know what you're getting at. Um, there is, there's two ways of dealing with clefts when, uh, when they're first like, discovered. Some people do what's called a primary bone graft on a youngster, which we do not do, and it's pretty much out of, out of favor. Uh, the question about the name Faded. Bill Profit. Bill Profit. He's the Bill Profit of craniofacial cleft palates. Uh, he's done more work than anybody else in the world. And he's done a lot of studies on these things. And the idea is to try to cut down as much surgery as you can, uh, that is to do in the least amount of time. Timing is important relative to the individual. Um, uh, you minimally have in a cleft lip and palate one or two surgeries to repair the lip, one be a lip adhesion, one be a complete re uh, uh, repair. Then you have to have a soft and hard palate. That's done about somewhere around 16 to months to, eight, uh, to two years, generally, people talk about. And then you've got a bone graft to be done if, in fact, you've got a complete alveolar lip cleft because you want to have a one piece of maxilla and uh, also that bone where the teeth erupt and also to correct a unilateral crossbite if it's a single because in fact the, the short side, the left hand side always collapses immediately so that's when you expand them in the bone graft and stuff. Then you wait for healing, teeth come in and then you treat them and often you have a retrognathic maxilla even though the cases start way out here, the maxilla way forward of the mandible, it's the just absolute opposite of what you see uh, in a class two with a typical kid where the mandible's back and the maxilla's normal. This goes the other way around. So you've got to have a distraction or somehow bring that or have a Laport 1 done or a Laport 1 with it, a PSSO in the lower uh, to bring them together and then you finish up your ortho. It's a long, long, intensive uh, amount of work. A lot of just observation, uh, but a lot of it, you know, when you get into it, there's a lot of orthodontics involved. Uh, one of the big problems we have in smaller states, i.e. where we are in Connecticut, is we don't have enough of a population to have a full-time paid uh, orthodontist in a, a facility such as Yale. Uh, so they're stuck with people like Gary and I, where they're the orthodontist for the team. And um, we just, we lose more.
money on every day. I don't care if they're private or insurance, because there's no way we can get paid reasonably. Uh, a state pays, for example, and they pay us approximately $3,200 for 16 years of treatment. Um, therefore, the young kids, particularly the millennials, that need the money, don't want to work too hard, don't want to be stressed, blah, blah, blah. They don't want to touch it. So we're very, we, we've got about 200 cases in our office. And if you have any other questions about it, please keep the Gary or I on. I'd like to do that, and, and I think they're very fortunate to be stuck with you guys. I think that's great. Uh, one final question I have is, is if, if you wait until later and you do the surgical procedure mm -hmm. and you advance the maxilla because of mid-face deficiency, uh, is that stable? We've seen it to be very stable in our office. Um, I really can't even think of one that we've done that we've seen much of a relapse from it. Okay. Very good. Any other questions? Uh, Gary, I want to thank you for, no, for thank giving you. your presentation. This is the one that I've been looking forward to seeing. A uh, number of years ago, I can't recall exactly where it was, but uh, Gary gave a real short presentation on some of these cases that he presented today. But th these are different cases now than what he had presented then, and they were superb. <clears throat> and that stayed in the back of my mind. And this is why I became involved in working with a lot of these cleft palate patients in my area. And I've got a lot of cleft palates there. And, and after I did my first two or three, I started getting more and more coming in. And I need to go back now and pick up more additional information. So I'll be going to Dr. Profit. I'll be going to, be going to Dr. Open. <clears throat> and uh, anyone else has any other suggestions, I'd like to have that advice from you. So thank you very much. I appreciate oh, it. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, thank you. You know, that's, that's the beauty of being with the College of Diplomates. We have this time to discuss, pre present, then discuss. And it always stimulates to go in, into and do more, more different, different, difficult type cases. And this is going to Thank you.